Bueno, Arratxaldeon, mi esker arquitectura institutora gerturatzea gatik. Bueno, Andreu Toden itzaldi honekin nasiko dugu arboretumen erakusketako itzaldi sorta. Nun, iru bloke edo tematikotan zatitu ditugunak, lehenengo bloke hau ez izango da. Nun, pixkat erakusketaren inguruan ikusitako proiektu ezberdinak aztertzakoan eta batez ere mauskaraguz institutoko ezkuntza zarduratzen den Anabel eta Karlosek beraiek asiratik identifikatu zuten nola gaur egun zuaitzen inguruan ere ezkuntzaren aletik lan asko egiten ari da bai Euskadin, Espainia Maian eta Internazionalki ere batez ere jolastoki eta ikastoletako espazioa espazioetan berdea berreskuratzeko. Orduan, bueno, asieratik hori zantzan institutoak erakusketara gehitu nahi zuen gaietako bat eta erakusketan pieza bat izan ordez, boetu bat ekedan irabaki denun bazela interes haundi bat piztu zizakeen gai bat, itzaldi edo topaketa batzuk atolatzekoa erena. Orduan, lehenengo bloke guzti hau horri buruz izango da. Gaur, Andri Utoek, pixkat marko teorikoa edo filosofikoa goa izango dugu asiera bezala. Eta bihar, ja, egun guztia, magak izan bezala, topaketak izango ditugu, nun bai Barcelona, Sevilla, Laba, Gipuzkoa eta Bizkaiako ere duaz berriak ikusiko ditugun. Eta baita ere, bueno, arratxaldean, ba, bizkat kontrapuntu moduan, Andres Jakeren estudiotik etorriko dira kolegio regio proiektua zaltzera. Nun, ikastola, bueno, edo eskola hori berria denez, horren txobertan bukatu da obra eta ustet, ba, erabiltzen, ez dakit erabiltzen ari diran dagoeneko, edo, bueno, erabiltzeko prez dagoen aia, ba, bueno, ba, pixkat beraiek aurreratuagoa izan dute aukera, nun natura ja ez dute zertan berreskuratu behar, baizik eta proiektuaren asieratik edo genesisetik baia integratua dago bertan. Bueno, en ese contexto que hablábamos un poco de arboretum y las charlas dedicadas a la renaturalización de espacios escolares, de las que trataremos más profundidad mañana, bueno, comenzamos con esta charla de Andrew Todd, donde queremos que sirva un poco como de marco teórico para poder comenzar a hablar de la relación o la importancia que tienen los árboles a la hora de configurar espacios habitables, que pueden ser como esos primeros espacios, esos primeros resguardos donde, donde los humanos eh, bueno, pues han compartido y se han transmitido conocimiento unos a otros. Y es un poco lo que, bueno, a través del libro que presenta Andrew, queremos eh, pues, eh, presentar para dar paso a mañana a las jornadas que trataremos como más técnicamente de los tema concreto de la renaturalización de espacios escolares. So, thanks so much, Andrew. I'm not even going to bother to try to speak in Spanish, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and speak slowly in English. And if you have any questions, you know, interrupt me by all means. I mean, I hope this is going to be an exchange uh, and we'll try and leave some time for discussion at the end. Uh, because the theme that Martin introduced to me was the theme of learning. And I know that you are you have a focus here, uh, and it's a political question I've just discovered about uh, um, children not having enough green space and uh, reintroducing vegetation into education space. Now, there are other countries I go to quite a bit, like Austria where, and Denmark, where I work quite a bit, and I'll show you some things from, from Denmark, where that would just be anathema. I mean, if, you, if you're a child and you don't come back from recess covered in mud and, and with a few leaves in your hair, you know, there's, a, there's just almost like a national scandal. Uh, and there were really, you know, there's microbiological research into the need for children to have contact with dirt uh, and contact with, uh, you know, with other living things and what have you. And, and in Paris, where I'm, I'm based, partly based, it's, uh, it's a hot political topic and I hope that we can maybe help you with some transfer of experience because the current administration uh, who I work with closely and follow closely and support a lot 
uh, and I'll show you, I think, one example of a project that we've, we've thought about together. They're closing down streets, and they're plant uh, streets in front of schools. In fact, they're trying to do this for every school in the city, um, so that the parents waiting can be in a nice situation, the children can come out of school and play. And then they're also taking the opportunity to put trees on these streets. Now, this is also, it's a kind of macro political issue. It's not just about having you know, a nice environment. We're going to look into more, some of the complexity of what trees do to us and, and what we do to them. Uh, but it's also a, a, a kind of, you know, a, a biophysical question in a dense city like Paris of actually lowering the temperature of the city yeah. and, you know, cleaning the air and lowering the temperature of surfaces. I mean, people are getting very, very aware nowadays. I, I have, I lived by Place de la Bastille. I have a, I have a small dog who's watching this at home, I think, with my wife. And uh, uh, the pavement is sometimes too hot for our animal companions. So the new districts in Paris are actually being planned, you know, color has gone from being an aesthetic issue to becoming a climate issue. Uh, so dark colored ground surfaces, you know, which can reach 70 degrees uh, centigrade are a little bit out of the question these days. So all of these, you know, there's a sort of revolution going on where, you know, there's a, an awareness of all these things and how they all intersect and how, you know, if we getting back to the point in history, which was really very, very recent, only about 70 years ago, where we didn't have what we thought was abundant and unlimited and unconstrained uh, energy to transform the world to our, to our means, um, you know, we're starting to sort of uncover, not in a conservative way, in a new way, because, you know, the, the, the challenges are so much bigger these days and m much more urgent, but, you know, we're starting to sort of turn the clock back on some of these issues and get back to, uh, you know, simple things. Now, I want to talk about learning, uh, I'm, as I said, uh, in not in Spanish, although, uh, hold on, it's not working here. Uh, here we go. Uh, and then even in Basque. And uh, there's a specific reason for that, which, and one of the reasons why I'm here, I mean, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted, as I, you know, I hope it's clear to sort of learn from you and exchange from you. This is one of the things I love about uh, living in Europe, that you know, you have really very, very strong cultural, geographical, climatic, uh, uh, diversity and differences and you know you have to sort of it's a lifelong process to confront these things and and, and listen and uncover things and, and um, along with one of the participants in the in the Arboretum exhibition upstairs uh, Ron Henderson one of the contributors to that exhibition we're currently working on a project in the, the French bit of the Basque country um, on a large park and also on some cultural facilities in relation to a park. So, so you know, this is something that uh, I'm trying to get my head around a bit. I mean, in this, I can't show you the project just yet, but, uh, you know, some of the things that we're fascinated by as beginners, you know, early learning process in the region are things like, you know, the, the, the power of the tree of Guernica and the agency that that exported to other trees in villages and how trees became, you know, a kind of focus of communication and somehow truth or power uh, and sincerity and things like that. Uh, and then other aspects of, you know, vegetal life and, uh, uh, and also wood construction, you know, and the parliament obviously in Guernica being a sort of shared, something about this idea about sort of surrounding uh, an object and creating, you know, sort of circular gathering spaces as a primal thing, which is, we're working on it in this project, but uh, I'll show you a, a finished project where that, that was a very, very big thing. Now, I'm, I'm here also to plug a book which fortunately relates to your theme <coughs> um, quite strongly, actually. It's called, uh, well, The Clearing, How We Live and Die with Trees. This is a proof copy without all of the doodles on the front. Um, this was published in Denmark uh, a, a few months ago. And I'll tell you a bit about it um, and as a way sort of into the speech and also, but as a way really as the sort of fundamental idea that uh, my burgeoning relationship with trees as an architect educated in, well, initially at Cambridge, uh, doing something else and then going to the United States and studying with some acolytes of Le Corbusier and becoming, you know, sort of fascinated with plasticity and freedom of form and all this kind of stuff. And then later in life, you know, reaching maturity really, having this sort of lightning bolt to my past and realizing that, well, A, we can't do that kind of stuff anymore. And B, if we don't do it, what do we do? You know, what's the new language? What's the new way of working, the new way of speaking? where you have you know, both sort of constraints, but also incredible new forms to, to explore. And that's more or less what uh, 
what we're doing in my practice, but it's also I'm sort of laying out some of the theoretical underpinnings of that in this book, which has um, three, well, four, sorry, four sections. And the first one <coughs> called Seed, it's, uh, it starts in, in quite a personal tone because it's about my relationship to my father who died whilst I was writing the book. And he was a botanist and a forest manager. And he didn't tell me shit all about trees. I learned nothing from him, basically. And we inherited from him this bonsai you see there, which I started with him when I was 11, which has kind of grown up silently. And uh, now it's become part of our lives. And so our former, former dog, actually, not the one watching tonight. And um, this, you know, part of that sort of, uh <coughs> part of the joy, really, of exploring this, that topic has been to si be able to situate myself in a cycle that's much, much bigger than, than my own biography and life and possible achievements. So this poor little tree here, which I love and which is very happy now, which I had to dig out of the ground in England and rip away from a very happy situation for it, but there was no question of leaving it there. Um, you know, that's something which kind of you know embeds my childhood a certain wish for as an 11 year old for a kind of control and for a model world where everything was you know at my own scale and and uh you know wasn't going to sort of get out of control and now obviously it, it symbolizes it's got <laughs> many many layers of meaning a bit like the sort of guernica tree has sort of acquired all sorts of truths over the years and it's obviously a stand in you know for this uh, this chap there on the left who's by the way in our house in the kitchen of our house in, in Burgundy, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, he's also, uh, Peter Todd, is a protagonist in the book for a very specific reason in this uh, section, because he, uh, uh, towards the end of his career, was commissioned to do a tree survey of Ascension Island, which you probably know is a speck in right in the middle of the Atlantic, halfway between Angola and Brazil. Um, it's a place that was sort of well, it was basically a sort of volcanic cinder block. And it has an absolutely fascinating story because um, Charles Darwin stopped there when he was on his way back from the first voyage of the Beagle and found a place rather fascinating. It's also, by the way, a messaging point and still is today. It's one of the very few places on Earth where they, they use as a controller for GPS uh, and refueling for wars and stuff like that. And that's one, one reason why it was uh, colonized. But Darwin had this absolutely crazy idea of... Uh, terraforming this island. And he contacted uh, 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 Robert Hooke, his botanist, who was, uh, his father was the head of Kew Gardens, and said, look, let's try something out. There's this uninhabitable island in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, let's just take a bunch of trees there and see what happens. And uh, they did that over a very long time, lo longer than both of their, their lifespans. And basically what happened was um, they created a climate so they created a, a cycle of water so that there were clouds and then you know there was all sorts of things that got rather uh, you know out of out of our control anyway in that in that context even though we set it off and then there were all sorts of other <coughs> very interesting detailed ex you know interactions between ferns donkeys who would escape from gardens and go to another part of an island and carry seeds and and then you know there'd be sort of waves of certain plants so anyway my my father was sent there as a monitor, just to sort of see what the, you know, what the state of play was amongst all these things, because there's no economic reason to control this. They're just kind of interested to see what's happening over time. And once a generation or so, they send someone like him there uh, to, to have a look at it. Now this, I'll probably I'll explain this and we can get into more detail of it if, if, if you're interested. But um, this particular experience of his resonated very, very strongly with my own uh, rich and multivocal dialogue with Bruno Latour and his circle, who for the last 12 years or so have been very, very interested in microcosms, uh, in closed and open systems, and, and how we, you know, we're sort of misperceiving uh, the world as an object. Um, we're thinking of it as a sort of stable sphere, uh, you know, which is kind of uh, safe and solid, whereas in fact, and this is following, you know, Lovelock <coughs> and Lynn Margulis. Uh, it's just, in the words of uh, uh, Lovelock, I think, uh, or maybe you know, it's actually Bruno's words, it's just a varnish. You know, what subsists, uh, what, what actually allows us to, to exist and, and breathe in this very room is these guys. Uh, and, you know, the inhabitable aspect of Earth goes from really a few meters below ground 
to a few hundred meters into the air. And it's basically occupied by trees. And trees are, you know, the great protagonists of this, obviously, who, along with plankton and various other things, <laughs> microbial life, you know, they are our hosts, basically. And this is one of the premises of this book. It's about how we behave as guests. I mean, we're not just guests, you know, we're modifying the system, and, you know, everyone's kind of playing along here. Um, but we are, you know, guests of a very particularly boorish and unthinking and uh, uh, arrogant and aggressive nature, you know, who haven't necessarily been aware of our own impacts on things until recently, and we're catching up with that quite fast. Not all of us, but you know, some of us are. <coughs> so. It's actually, it's actually quite fun to talk about this. I wasn't intending to spend quite as much time, but um, this book looks backwards at you know the stories we tell ourselves about how we got started off and how we got to where we are. Because it occurred to me rereading some of them, uh, particularly Vitruvius, you know where we have a received apprehension of the lessons of Vitruvius, um, which are in fact more or less formed by a Catholic mindset from the 15th century going onwards, because that's when the text was sort of, you know, translated, published, rediscovered, and what have you. And uh, you know, Vitruvius, being, shall we say, pre-Christian, um, yeah, was someone whose messaging had to be, you know, sort of woven into other strains of, uh, of intellectual thought and made made to fit in. Whereas, so we think of, you know, the guy spread out like that. We think of, you know, the anthropocentric. Uh, measure of the universe uh, and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's partly through imaging as well, because, you know, these are, a bit, I mean, it's Leonardo much later, obviously, who made that a very, very, you know, memorable concept through, through a drawing, uh, an engraving, actually. Whereas, going back and rereading this stuff, you know, for the first time since I was a student, I was blown away. When you read the, you know, the, or the, the story of the origins of architecture, uh, which is right at the beginning, Vitruvius talks about how, well, first of all, it was trees who kind of set everything off because Prometheus or God or whoever didn't discover fire. Um, there was an accidental rubbing together of branches in a forest which produced sparks, which produced fire. And then these kind of hairy creatures who crawled out of the forest and started staring at this and realized that they could keep it and what have you. And it became a social center, a bit like the Guernica tree. Um, and what was beautiful in this story, I, I found, I mean, reading it with these sort of fresh eyes of, of our own particular crisis, is that uh, the transition from, you know, quote unquote, uh, animal condition to civilized condition um, was not a sort of, it wasn't, you know, the finger of God in Michelangelo's creation, just infusing him with life, or even, you know, even worse, you know, kind of taking out the rib of Adam to create womankind, or, you know, these kind of magical instantaneous transformations like that. It was a gradual process. And most importantly, um, the humans became human uh, and invented architecture and spaces for shelter by a, a, not just a conviviality, but a sort of admiration of the animal world by observing how, and he says this, you know, how birds made their nests and how, you know, other species were, were sort of creating conditions of shelter for themselves. And basically, you know, in our own sort of ideology, uh, this, you know, this is Filaretti's uh, uh, Vitruvius Adam, so they're already, he's already kind of grafting these two myths together, saying, you know, that uh, somehow, you know, Adam Vitruvius making shelter and, you know, the kind of four post thing, you know, which becomes the basis of all this, you know, sort of 18th century ideology in France about uh, the separateness and the gentleness of nature and how we contemplate it from the outside and we just want it to be, you know, the right proportions and, you know, and, uh, everything's kind of nice and tickety boom, what have you. So, you know, we've sort of veered very far without realizing it from you know, what I take to be a very simple and what you could say in contemporary parlance would be an interspecies story by uh, Marcus Vitruvius Polio. So that's the point of departure. Um, the book sort of moves off in various directions. I mean, it basically, it could have been, one, one of the working titles was Family Tree. And it's really a book, of, it's actually a book about families and about duration uh, across generations. And it just so happens that, you know, it's also a sort of lightweight comparative uh, anthropology because it uh, touches down in some places I know and some that I don't know, um, where, let's say, the prosperity 
and the, the, the human intelligence of the use of trees in the forest, and we'll get into that in a minute, um, can only happen because it's across several generations. It can't be like one person going in there with their knowledge. It's a, it's a slow process. It can accelerate very quickly at times. And that can be, you know, there's obvious examples here with, you know, there's a lot of stuff about uh, the colonization of the US and, you know, extraction and how the forest there was killed very, very quickly. Although part of the reason, it's, it's, I mean, astonishing stuff uh, I discovered reading this, but uh, the main export from the, you know, the US colonies back to Europe was trees because they didn't have any more firewood in Europe. And this was a sort of, you know, this was bling luxury that you could, you know, have a fireplace in every room if you were a colonizer in the US and then put it on Instagram and boast about it to your friends back home. Um, but you had sort of warmth in every room because, uh, you know, they, they, they basically exhausted the resources already. You know, we're talking about the 17th, 18th century here. And of course, they did the same thing very quickly in the US. And there's all sorts of stories about <coughs> the relationships with uh, native populations and, you know, how that sort of lightness, uh, you can just, see, you know, obviously see that just in this image here, the lightness of touch. And then also some amazing things uh, I, I discovered about the, the cooperations which happened, which was, so a lot of vernacular wood architecture uh, emerging in the US and then, you know, sort of re-exported to Europe, uh, relied on Native American skills with access in terms of treating wood and creating shingles and things like that. So it's, you know, the, and their own, Apprehension of the landscape was not like like you know any situation, including the whole of Amazonia, um, was not you know a totally sort of passive uh, relationship to the to the forest. It was actually interventionist, but respectfully so. I mean, there were all sorts of patterns that were created, you know, to help with hunting. There was also an more of an awareness of cycles, but you know, there's no such thing as a primal forest in that situation. No, we you can't avoid engaging with it. Here's a perfect example, <coughs> which is in contemporary politics. I won't cite the name of the famous Danish architect in the middle of the image, but you recognize uh, Jair Bolsonaro and this charming quote of his, um, where he says, the interest in the Amazon isn't in the Indian or the fucking tree, it's in the mining. So this is, you know, we're back to evangelical, uh, you know, extractionist, uh, uh, you know, human uh, imp imperialist uh, uh, dominant thought and, you know, some famous architects with nice green reputations are willing to fall into that trap and, you know, that's, that's the bottom line, you know, we know very, very well. <laughs> that's the front line of a civilizational end game where it's also, you know, yet again, um, uh, autochthonous people who, you know, have a deep understanding which hasn't been sort of codified, broadcast, uh, and made into instrumentalized knowledge, uh, which can be absorbed by our institutions, um, which we're just starting to uncover. So there's uh, uh, Sonia Guajara, uh, Guajara uh, who I have met, and I know some people in her circle, is the first indigenous people's minister in the current Lula government uh, in Brazil. And a great deal of what they're talking about is just trying to help us whiteies to understand the forest and you know what the uh what the real issues are there and and what the you know the immense dangers which we we know quantitatively you know if you look at something like that or there's some satellite maps in the book where you see the the pace of destruction um you know but there's just so much that we're not seeing right beneath our feet i just to come back to to bruno who's obviously uh, you know his great uh, lesson uh supports and, and and gave so much to all of this I th one of the upsides of the mess that we're in right now is that uh, we are living in an age of discovery because, you know, time is running out, things are running out. But a lot of what I find the most interesting thinking right now, and <laughs> you've noticed we're no in architecture yet, but don't worry, we'll get there, um, is uh, about people looking carefully in detail at what we took for granted. Uh, you know, there's a fantastic book I read researching this, which is about someone who studied one square foot of forest for 10 years. And, you know, that, actually focusing on that, you know, is there's more going on there than one square meter or even one block of Manhattan. And, uh, you know, it's rather behooves us to, to understand that a bit. Here's some other, I mean, the book sort of roams quite wide. This is an amazing example of the, uh, uh, the, the Mbuti population in Central Africa. Now, I, funnily enough, I knew about them 
through an earlier connection to the theatre director Peter Brook uh, and his connection to the anthropologist Colin Turnbull. Uh, it's one of these fortunate leaps. Um, and Turnbull was the first person in the 1950s to go and live with these people and understand how they live with the forest uh, in his book Forest People, which is a, is a great sort of a early um, piece of modern anthropological fieldwork. And the interesting thing here were A, they're living in kind of bucky domes, uh, and B, the builders and the architects are women in order to, because the men are basically out hunting, uh, but the, the, the physical and social structure of the village is made from immediate available resources. So, you know, knowledge of plants, bending, how to cut, you know, assemble, range the very, very heavily for a few hours every day. So they literally build a village in, you know, in, in the morning um, with putting these amazing, you know, folded, it's a bit like, the you know, the scales on the, on the Bilbao Guggenheim, but uh, with a lower carbon footprint, um, where they just sort of weave these um, mongongo leaves uh, so that it doesn't rain inside the huts. And then when they feel that they're, this is one amazing uh, uh, part of the story, when they feel that the forest is getting tired of them, they move on. It's not just about resources or there are no more elephants or monkeys to kill. Um, it's a sort of sense that, in a general sense, they leave before it gets tired. So it might be once every two or three months or something. Now, obviously, you know, this is a brutal political situation because they don't have our notions of borders. And, uh, you know, there's some tribes who think that it's good to eat these people still today. And, uh, you know, they're, they're in the front line. Again, a little bit like in Brazil because they... They live, their map doesn't intersect with ours in any way, shape, or form. They are, you know, comp they're, they're living on, literally living on another planet to us. And we have to go some way to understanding uh, the way they live, I think, in order to better live in our own way. Now, I'm, what, uh, one of the kind of leaps I make in the book, and we'll get into this a bit more technically later, um, is about the family of this guy, Hermann Kaufmann, who is a leading Austrian architect, I hope you've heard of him, um, and a pioneer of wood construction. And he's sitting, it's a photo I took of him, beneath the window of the room in which he was born. And uh, his family, over about five generations, have been working the forest and also working wood in the context of Western Austria and doing so many other things besides. But we'll, we'll come back to him later. But I, I see him, I couldn't help seeing him as a central figure, and his brothers and cousins and what have you, who are, you know, making a great deal of the wood, the engineered wood products that we're using these days, uh, as somehow related to the Mbuti women. A few sort of, uh, well, these were a few other examples from my own contact with Japan, uh, making things out of bamboo when I was staying there, and also encountering, uh, you know, the kind of ongoing force of uh, Shinto as a, as a, you know, as a cultural. Uh, energy in Japan. This is at the house of an architect friend of mine. The people sitting around here are all sort of, you know, university professors and intellectuals. And what we've been doing is spending the morning welcoming the spirit of the field and his girlfriend into the house for the winter and throwing a feast for them. So it's a sort of lay ritual. And Shinto has this delicious kind of elasticity, um, which means that it's sort of it's all pervasive and doesn't necessarily need. In fact, very often. In, in this village, uh, the, Shin, the Shinto, temp Shinto temple is a tree. That's it. <laughs> it's just a gatepost in the forest. And everyone knows and recognizes the tree, the Shinto priests, the lay people, and what have you. So there's something about that tradition which I find, you know, kind of reverberates through contemporary architecture like Kengo Kuma. I don't think Kengo, I got to know him when I was there, I don't think he necessarily says so openly, but, uh, you know, it's something that's sort of in in the air and in the, in the vibes in that country very much, which is obviously an extremely advanced and extremely, you know, technophile country. But there's, the, there's other things going on there, I think, which we, we should be foregrounding. And then the book sort of returns to source. And these are just, my father was an artist as well. And these are, there's a selection of his drawings of sort of rather strangely uh, animated natural forms, uh, you know, trees and branches, which seem to be sort of, you know, bursting with life uh, and things like that. He wasn't necessarily, you know, consciously 
a conceptual artist, but this was just something he felt, the sort of imminence in these things that he spent his life uh, tending to, observing, and, and also uh, uh, caring for. Now, I'm going to sort of move into more of a directly professional story now, and you can tell me if any of this adds up at the end. Um, but this is a, a sort of surrogate father figure for me, which is Peter Brook and his wife Natasha. Now, Peter uh, kind of uh, invited me when I was in my 20s to write the book with him at the top right, which is about his his research work on theatre space. You probably know him. You know, he's this sort of great 20th, early 21st century theatre director who was. Uh, not, not just important for, for theatre people. The book at the bottom right, The Empty Space, was more or less the reason why I became an architect. And it has a, you know, a great many interesting philosophical questions, which it was a book from 1968, but it, they resonate more and more strongly, I find, because he's talking about frugality and essentialism. And you know, at that time, he was doing stuff like this on the left, which was going into the Sahara and with a troupe of actors and you know, working in a kind of laboratory condition with, uh, you know, <laughs> with, with nothing else and in a very, very intense encounter with people, not quite the Mbutis, but with very often, you know, encountering people who hadn't seen a Westerner before. And then another important part of his work, uh, which resonates differently for me now, especially as both he and Bruno have died, uh, is his own attachment to the freedoms afforded by non-human life in performance. So in a perform in, he, in his particular space, it's a little bit, a little bit like the, the the charm of this space here, which is it's a fantastic space to give a lecture and I hope also to listen in. It has a very nice acoustic. But I mean, we have these plants, but you can see also that there's been all sorts of microbial life which has been uh, hanging out here and benefiting from it, which we have managed to completely erase with the restorations. But it's still there anyway, and it's in our lungs and on our skins, you know. And, and a, a space like this, and also like Peter's amazing theatre, the Bouffe du Nord in Paris, where he'd very often just put soil on the floor and, and ponds of water and some fire and what have you. Uh, and he left the walls in a state of ruin, but then, you know, kind of reinvented them. There was no sort of fetishization of the, of the ruin, as you very often find in architectural discourse. It was a, it was a pragmatic and a, and a dynamic tool for his work because it destabilized time. It was neither now nor future nor, nor then. It was just kind of elastic. And, and he could move around in that in a very particular way. And that's something that I, it's a, I mean, instinctively, but now somewhat, you know, <laughs> thinking about it a little bit, uh, it's a quality that I recognize in buildings uh, which you know, move me or which endure is a, is a certain capacity for, for openness. It may, may only be sort of skin deep, but, uh, you know, buildings that don't, that are not supposed to weather at all, like heroic modernism, um, which are always weathers very, very badly, of course, you know, uh, are a slightly uh, different story of the, of the modernist project. And uh, I think, you know, there are counterexamples, many of them, obviously, uh, very, very positive of buildings which engage with time. And it's not its not time, you know, it's other life forms. I mean, it's erosion from certain natural elements. But in the case of these walls, you know, it's, it's because there are sorts of, uh, you know, yeast and microbes and things like that, which have gnawed away at the plaster and fed on it and, you know, given it this dynamic uh, coating. Now that's, uh, you know, that sounds quite glib, but I didn't have, you know, it's 30 years I've been working on this with Peter, nearly 30 years. Um, I didn't have that thought until about six months ago because it's part of that sort of weaving and you know my own lifelong learning process where the lessons coming in you know from Bruno and his gang and Emmanuel Ecotcher and people like that are constantly redefining you know this sort of what you think you know you'd, uh, it's not an edifice it's a uh, books are actually uh, the, the book I wrote then in, in particular you know it's for me is strangely alive like these walls uh, but you have to sort of stir it up like you do compost uh, or, or a garden. So here's some examples of Peter's amazing work, which you'll see reflected in mine. And I also wanted to, I said, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Paris, but uh, I also have the great benefit of walking out of my other office door and seeing things like this and this um, and this. And this actually on the left is a, is a tree which is in a book by Ron, who's uh, in the exhibition upstairs. 
Um, this is part. Uh, this is the surroundings that I actually a bit more habitually now work in in this village in Burgundy, and it's also kind of changed the way, certainly the way I think uh, as an architect, because people might come f with enormous trucks with Romanian number plates because they bought a chunk of forest and chop it down in a day uh, because it's just been traded on some invisible distant market and it's a forest where I would go with my dog every morning and it disappears from one minute to the next because it, it's, you know, its value has gone up on a chart in the Office National des Forêts. So it's, you know, the, again, another sort of uh, awareness raising exercise to see just how brutal this stuff is. And I, I build in wood now. So, you, you know, you just have to be very conscious, obviously, of you know what you're taking and why you're taking it. Um, maybe have you heard of Richard Powers, the American novelist, who wrote this fantastic book, The Overstory, which is a kind of giant. It's like sort of the, the Moby Dick of the climate crisis. It's a book about how trees help us. I mean, it's something that we very much encourage you to look at in the context of this exhibition. It won the Pulitzer Prize a couple of years ago. Uh, it's been read by the Pope and Barack Obama endorsed it uh, as a life, you know, kind of life and vision changing text. Uh, same thing for me too. And now Richard was very close to Bruno. I got to know him. And when he found out that I was chopping down trees to make buildings, he said, you know, that's fine. But what you do with these things has to be as miraculous as what they were originally. You know, you can't just treat it as a resource or cubic meters or value or, or, or structural strength. And that's a lot of what actually this, this book is about. So just briefly, this is a funny place. It's a historic ballroom which has lots of uh, interesting annex spaces, which are a joy to live in, and then big spaces to work in, which not many architects are fortunate enough to have. So I'm an apprentice carpenter as well, and I start building things like this um, with friends, which is the facade for the studio, stealing the handles from, nicking the idea for the handles from uh, Latourette, uh, Le Corbusier, the handles that he used there, they're actually not his design, which we had measured and reproduced. And uh, and then also inventing things and making a lot of things with my hands, which is just a fantastic thing to do as an architect. You know, when you get to my stage of a career, you're mostly a manager and, and a PR person and what have you. Uh, it's just so important to go back to kind of factory level work like this, putting 750 hinges on these uh, wooden blades, A, to understand, you know, what that kind of work is like, and B, to understand how, you know, standardization <laughs> is very rarely standardized. Uh, that even with you know very kind of repetitive components, there are all sorts of things going on, and in particular these, because they're wood. And then this is another you know messing around with furniture, which was actually born as a facade idea for a building, for a competition which didn't go ahead. Um, now this place also allows us to create cultural collisions in a strange kind of way because it's surrounded by trees, I think. And this is uh, Bruno. Latour, uh, acting as a lighting technician with his wife uh, Chantal, who is uh, about to torture me with some Schubert. And uh, we have tended to have this Patrick Bouchard, who's a very inspiring French architect with my wife in her studio, Bridget O'Rourke. Um, and we do tend to have things happen there, uh, like this choreography or these concerts with uh, Benjamin Koppel and Daryl Hall, um, which are which branch out in ways that they wouldn't necessarily do in an urban context, partly because people have to stay together and partly because you meet people in this context like farmers uh, and winemakers who are not the typical people who would show up to an event like this, you know, in, a, in an urban center. So this has become, we're just getting, just getting going on this. Ron is omnipresent here. There's another drawing by Ron Henderson of our fig tree. Um, we're not alone, and I sense also, because I, I write quite a lot about contemporary theatre, uh, I follow a lot of big theatre events like the Avignon Festival. This was what happened there last year. This is a, a big day-long promenade uh, by Stefan Kegi and Caroline Barno, where instead of sitting in a theatre, we sat in a natural setting. I mean, this chap who was a performer, um, he didn't have the choice but to sit. There was a piece about differently abled people and how they apprehend nature. Uh, he's facing this uh, transparent rendition of a Caspar David Friedrich painting. Um, we encountered a real winemaker in his real tractor and we had a sort of Brechtian debate about uh, 
earthworms and you know 150 people were riveted for the whole day there's an appetite for this kind of stuff and it's you know it's becoming rather prevalent in the theater world this was the conclusion of that where we sort of watched this screen with a very very loud voice coming from the forest until until it went dark so and then other examples this is philip ken in the quarry in bulbon and this is one of my own projects actually this is a scenography we did for a big open air performance in a forest <laughs> in a quarry in a forest uh, in Luxembourg, which was about displacement. It was about the evacuation of a city. So we made this sort of little model city, which was sort of uh, uh, transmogrified by a video projection. Other currents going on, I mean, this is, I love this image. It's the Grand Arche de la Défense. Have you, do you know about La Femme du Bonheur? I mean, there is a, a real farm just, just by it. I mean, you, what, what's beautifully cropped out of this photo is that, you know, there are sort of cars and trains going right past these sheep. And uh, this guy is called Roger Desprez, who's a kind of farmer, philosopher, activist. And I spent a day with him in Bouchain actually doing this, taking a herd of sheep through, through La Défense. We started at the Grand Arche and we went through all these residential districts, uh, which, uh, believe me, is a, <laughs> is a really revealing thing to do because people have all this kind of repressed and latent love for animals which they can express so easily you know like bankers and housewives and what have you were rushing out into the street to meet these lambs and they by the way were geniuses at finding the tiniest little weed or blade of grass in this very austere situation so there are you know these kinds of collisions are have been going on and i think we've just become more aware of them. this is the cartoucherie de vincennes just outside of paris where i mean this area just to the right of this industrial former armaments factory actually from the first world war is a biotope so i am manushkin and her company and a bunch of uh, other very important directors like uh, carolyn carlson are working in this context with you know much more freedom in a way uh, than i have in burgundy but you know in a, in a similar sort of mode so in other words once you start facing the trees and and uh, you know, realizing the opportunities and the liberties that uh, they're afforded by, you know, this is a company meeting of the Terre du Soleil. Um, you start to, I find, you know, your your life becomes richer. Now, uh, to get a bit more nerdy, let's go back to the Austrian guy I was comparing to, the African pygmies. Um, another important aspect of my work, one that I really cherish, uh, is to do with learning. I'm not, I don't teach in a conventional way in an architecture school. Instead, I teach executives and builders in a Scandinavia's second largest construction company how to forget about concrete and go towards wood. And it's a fascinating anthropological experience as much as anything else. Um, because you're working on knowledge on the one hand, but also on um, people's uh, feelings and you know their aspirations and their feelings of guilt towards their children, even their grandchildren, uh, and how they can actually very very fast you know transform <coughs> their actions so that you know they're consuming less carbon as a you know as a, obviously as a very large corporation. So the first thing I did with them is I took them right into that oval, <laughs> which is Western Austria, Southern Germany. Um, which, and that's them <laughs> on that trip, uh, about 30 of them senior management. And we met uh, Herman and his team. Now, Herman is a great architect to my mind, working you know, with a very sort of austere palette of shapes and forms because no big curves, no huge cantilevers. Uh, uh, you know, you're re rigid, we're working in, in a frugal and a, and a reduced way. It doesn't stop you doing extraordinary things like this building at the bottom left built over a lake, which was the largest wooden building in the world at the time, which is only like 15 years ago. I mean, it's amazing how fast this, this, this sector is changing. And this is a room. This is, I mean, just to show you <laughs> what, uh, what happens when you start looking at things uh, differently. Uh, you know, one might normally, this is, in, uh, this is a meeting room in a fire station. And normally you might have, you know, you say, like, okay, I've done 40 square meters and I've got an acoustic ceiling and I've got a linoleum floor, which is easy to maintain, you know, tick that box. It's a meeting room. This is an apps, this is a kind of resonant, wonderful space. Um, the way you can just see it in this image, the way the floor has been kind of planed, uh, you know, you can spill stuff on it. It's uh, very enduring. And uh, people do, you know, Herman got married in here. 
uh, all sorts of things become possible because we give ourselves the opportunity to actually live with this material. I mean, it doesn't necessarily cost much more, but it takes a certain knowledge to do this well. That was one of the points I made with, uh, with these Danes. I'll skip over some of this. I mean, this, I'm sure you know, this was some of the stuff we were talking about early on with them. These are two buildings with the same structural format, um, concrete slabs, facades or wood slabs and facades, you know, so you can work with exactly the same thicknesses. And these are two buildings of identical weight. So it's not just about carbon, it's also about how quickly you can build and, you know, what you need to do with foundations and transport and all the other stuff. And now this is only looking at the building structures, but, you know, if you do the carbon calculations on those two buildings, you get five stories of concrete and a massive negative impact. Um, with the wood, you get 25 stories and you're actually saving 1,500 tons of CO2 equivalent. You know, that, that balances out eventually once you put all the other components of the building in. But as a you know kind of a starter illustration of the of the opportunities of what you can do with these things, I think it's an interesting thing. And you can do things like this, obviously, where you can deliver rooms fully finished. And this is one of our projects. We'll show, I'll show a few of them now um, for a demountable auditorium using these towers, which can be trucked. And built very, very quickly, and you know, because they're light, you can change the geometries of this. You can even put curves in, uh, and you have a kind of kit of parts which can, you know, be used very easily. And you don't have the kind of scaffolding and then something on top of the, you know, the wood is the structure and the finish at the same time, and you know, it has all of the the aesthetic virtues of wood as well. Uh, car parks we've been looking at for the days, you know, boring as hell. Car parks actually not. They're very, very difficult building type. They take up a huge amount of space. And um, I mean, they normally are extremely boring. But we started to look at what happens if you put with wood, you know, you can't, you don't get the same moment connections you can with concrete and steel. So if you put, the, if you kind of export the bracing structure, it's totally medieval, uh, and you create the triangulation on the outside, and then that can become walkways or planter space or what have you, then suddenly, you know, you have something that's a bit, hopefully, a bit less boring than. Than what we're used to in a, you know in, a, in an urban setting, we're actually looking at this on a potentially on quite a large commercial scale, and then you know again, boring, not boring, offices um, where we're noodling around with various ideas of massing spans which are not as big or as free as you can do with other materials. So this is you know a kind of early thinking about what this company could do with their headquarters, which they're going to have to build quite soon with a double skin facade with some wood that manifests as shading. Uh, other, if I just, I'm showing you a range of stuff here quite quickly because I realize time is flying. Um, <coughs> this is an opera house competition we did last year in Wuhan, where there's a kind of village of these uh, wooden buildings, uh, various scales, where the wood is played up. Obviously, you know, traditional Chinese opera, which was the, which was the program here, you know, was uh, always existed in wooden buildings with a certain proportion, a certain intimacy, and a certain warmth, uh, you know, that you get from the material. So short spans modular construction like this. This is for senior housing where you can do small things. You can fit on a lorry and slightly bigger things that don't, you know, so you can get some changes of scale and what have you and build very, very quickly. And then this is a project for a kind of large demountable house. So using repetitive units, you know, mod, you know, well, sorry, not repetitive units, using modular units, but which are all a little bit different. So it's very easy to, to, to take apart and put back together again but looking at what sort of ranges and richnesses of space you can get by having these structural boxes which just kind of sit one on top of another uh, and can perhaps create some you know, spaces uh, between them on the inside which are not what you'd necessarily associate with uh, repetitive modular construction. Uh, this is a competition, again, using modular construction for an arts residency in Burgundy, uh, creating this courtyard with a bunch of volumes that would just be sort of craned in and a very sort of tight juxtaposition between some of these spaces where we're trying to get some sort of a civic quality from, from the presence of wood there. Um, we're going to look at a few theatres because that's actually one thing that we have done a lot of. Uh, this is unfortunately unbuilt project for a theatre uh, on the River Seine, just south of Paris. It sparked a lot of other projects, uh, but it's a, it's a shame because it really could have been built. Um, this is a sort of wooden circus tent. Um, it has a sort of exoskeleton which can adapt to different climates at different times of the year. So it can kind of shade itself or wrap itself up. 
And it's a very, very simple structure. It's a bamboo roof structure with just a repetitive CLT ring around it with these big doors that open up over the river just behind it. And the idea being that you can use natural light, natural ventilation, and what have you. Uh, and you don't need much else, to be honest. And then we're even looking at using turbines in the river. This is a kind of punk cousin of that, using recycled paper as the uh, paper blocks, you know, as the, as the building material for acoustic and thermal insulation with a kind of simple roof structure suspended off the scaffolding. Uh, and, uh, and then this is, this is the project I uh, evoked earlier for the city of Paris where we're looking at how to recuperate some marginal sites, marginal in shape and, and difficulty, but uh, very, very central. In this case, this is uh, right on the River Seine by the Pont de l'Australitz. And the idea here was to, because uh, the site, it was very, very difficult actually to place buildings on it because of urban infrastructure underneath. A very light building like this made out of wood with some housing which would basically fund a cultural program. This is a private development project um, which was you know, launched by the, by the city of Paris uh, uh, with deliveries. So we would actually deliver the wood through this lock by boat, which has enormous benefits. So you're not sort of restricted by the widths of uh, lorries and stuff like that, and you can actually you know, ship this stuff all, all the way from the Rhine. They're doing this, actually, they really are doing this now for, the for parts of the Olympic Village in Paris. So basically, I mean, as you see, I'm showing, you know, just kind of flashing through a number of examples, and we'll, we'll end and linger a little bit more on this one. I hope it's become clear, uh, you know, how, well, A, I'm still learning, <laughs> and the more I know, the more I'm aware of how little I know, but also how wonderful uh, you know the the explore the exploration which remains to be done is, um, and then also once you start learning with trees and uh, you know cutting them up and, and putting them together, uh, it is just I mean it's something that is barely taught in architecture schools. It's something that you know uh, there's a, there's like a kind of drought. Uh, on a European scale, particularly of engineers who are able to, to work with this stuff, which is, is risky for the sector. And architects too, because suddenly you go from the traditional way of working in France is to, you know, kind of delegate details. So you pass control over to, you know, con contractors and build a control and the architect develops concept, aesthetic, skin, uh, plasticity, space, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, which works uh, fine for 70 years, you know, with abundant oil and concrete. And concrete is oil, basically. I mean, concrete is steel and things that need to be heated up and uh, very heavy and they have to be moved around a lot. So once you start taking, you know, imagine these sticks in your chairs there, you know, which are all carefully braced so none of you are falling off them. Um, but you know you can't. It's much more difficult to do moment connections between them. You're in a totally different world. As an architect, you have to be a maker. You have to think about how things go together. You have to have a completely different relationship with engineers, also with contractors. You want to work ahead of time with the contractors. If you're Herman, contractor's probably your cousin, uh, and then the, his grandfather was also a contractor. So there's this sort of slow accumulation of, of this learning, which is why they're the best, because they've been, you know, they've had a long run up to this kind of stuff. We can learn from them though. I mean, I proved it with these Danes, you know, who are really doing great stuff now. They're finishing a huge office complex. We're starting work on an 80 meter high tower in wood. So they've got this, they've got the bug, you know, they've got the, they've caught the enthusiasm and they're being helped. This, okay, so this is another big thing about learning with wood, which I found, which is that uh, it makes people more cooperative. It breaks down some of the sort of confrontational and uh, aspects of consultancy between different disciplines because it's, it's a shared objective, which is not, not, it's a technical objective, which is shared, but also there's an ideal involved there. Um, and uh, it's great fun. I'm, I'm convinced. <laughs> As it happens, this uh, encounter uh, it's not what it seems. Uh, the, the, the lady on the right there uh, was the world's most important private, fo private forester who had, at the beginning of her reign, she probably owned the Mbuti tribes. Uh, I mean, she had forest interests in, you know, former colonies in Africa, in, uh, you know, in the, the Southern Hemisphere, 
uh, in Ireland still. And um, what I was expecting to be quite a banal, you know, just kind of, here's my, here's my building, turned into a very technical conversation where she was wanted to know what forest the wood came from, how it was treated, uh, you know, how was it put together, uh, you know, what were the diameters of the columns. Uh, it was pretty surprising. And, you know, it's a very odd thing to think of someone, I mean, she's an extraordinary person, but to think of someone like her <laughs> reframing her in a different way. She has no official power, but she has obviously, she had enormous communicative power by, you know, what she could turn her attention to. And uh, her status, which is, gets quite Shakespearean, you know, she, she owned, and her son now owns, uh, the whole coastline around Britain, but the, the, the sea beyond the coastline, which is now being filled up with shit because we've lowered the environmental regulations after Brexit to, so that water companies can make more money. So in a way, you know, her as a revered figure in an almost Japanese kind of way, as a sort of abstraction of various ideals, she was a guardian of nature in a funny kind of way. You know, she had this sort of uh, <coughs> talismanic uh, character, which uh, in this instance, you know, in just in the details of this encounter, you know, she exhibited her force in the, the most kind of gentle Jedi way with just, you know, kind of <coughs> small movement of the hand, <coughs> which would lift you off your feet. So this building that she wanted to check out is uh, obviously a sort of uh, inheritor of this paradigm, which is the Elizabethan theater. That's maybe why. Uh, this is the only drawing we have kind of only accurate drawing that we have of the outside of one of these theatres uh, in London in the early 17th century. There were a bunch of them. And in northern France, they had the idea that they might want, it be an, might be a nice and friendly thing to do before Brexit happened, uh, to build one of these in an area where there were long-standing British associations. Charles Dickens lived in this village. Uh, Lutyens was the president of the golf club that was based at this castle. And he built a bunch of stuff, not right here, but in Normandy, and then also the graveyards from the First World War, and many of them are around here, so it's a resonant place. And we put this thing, well, which <laughs> stepped into a, a political minefield. Uh, this, was, this was something that happened just before the Brexit vote, where the far right in France vandalized the building just before it opened as a publicity stunt, but also, you know, as a sort of an act of uh, direct aggression against the building. And they, they had a track record of doing this with people like Anish Kapoor doing, you know, kind of contemporary looking things in Versailles, you know, where that was vandalized twice um, and uh, various other things like that. So I, I discovered this early on a Saturday morning, arriving with uh, actually a guy from the Théâtre du Soleil to put on a performance for the builders. And this damaging of the trees and the wood and the, the paint on the bamboo that had traveled from Bali <laughs> perfectly nicely until then, um, really touched a nerve, partly because the Queen had, you know, blessed this project, um, but also because there was, you know, there was a violence was already in the air in politics at that point, and, and in particular, you know, a certain violence around questions of ecology and, you know, the, the tensions that that produced. So this, this became a global news story, uh, and we managed to fix it uh, mercifully, but you, it's, it was... Uh, it was difficult. This building uh, was made by this robot in southern Germany. And one of the weird reasons why the wood industry is flourishing in Bavaria and Austria is because it's also very close to the automotive industry. So there's a lot, you know, the people making this stuff are always looking at, you know, kind of new ways to make shapes and bend and twist and cut and, and develop efficiencies. And they very often have a friend, you know, who might have a, a retired robot from a, a BMW production line and they realize they can attach a saw to it, you know, and they can program it to do all this kind of stuff. So there's a weird sort of, you know, it's not uh, Luddite, you know, there's a kind of high-tech uh, localism <laughs> which uh, affects this. So, you know, here you can see in this case, this was a, a first to make this building out of solid, you know, wood panels, CLT panels that were formed uh, on a curve, which was, you know, there's only one company who actually wanted to do this and, and they were not local to the site. So here's a few, that's what it ended up looking like. Now there was, this building was developed 
in the early stages of my conversations with Bruno Latour and his entourage, and Bruno uh, did theater as a way of helping people to understand climate questions. So in other words, to incite emotion and use stage technology to show geological strata at full scale and, and to show you know, how, as I said earlier, you know, we're misunderstanding really the, the question of the scale of the planet even because it's actually something microscopic that you know, we can pollute and, and destroy very, very easily. So this, you know, what you saw with all those leaves being assembled and you, know, you saw the beautiful site around it and what have you, you can see the natural light coming in here. This building as you know, a globe theatre, which in itself is, you know, it was used very consciously and strongly by Shakespeare as a, as a metaphor, uh, resonates in a different way here. And the idea, one of the ideas of this building, and I was strongly reminded this, of this today, going to Bilbao to pay homage to the recently departed Richard Serra, um, was about you know, this, the powerful force of enclosure, of feeling uh, contained, of uh, you know, feeling a sense of, of, of limits, and how you know, resonating through because you know we left the wood apparent here. We leave it, you know, kind of weeping resin. It still smells of wood after eight years. Uh, um, that maybe there's something in this, you know, which uh, which resonates and will help to resonate with our conditions. And actually, the theatre trilogy that Bruno developed with Frederick A. Twati was performed here last year, just uh, just exactly a year ago, and sadly after Bruno died. But uh, there was a sort of full circle question about that. And here you see some images of the space. You can see some of the imperfections in the wood that were, that were left, and a few images of the, of the space in its uh, building and its setting. And uh, the exterior is also meant to kind of break down this limit. So it's a subtle business. It's not just inside or outside. There is, there's a degree of ambiguity going on here. And as a final thought, I've been speaking for more than three seconds. Uh, that's how long it takes for the European forest to grow the wood to make that building. Thank you very much. Okay, now I've... It's a, it's a super simple calculation. <coughs> um, well, for one thing, you know, there's a lot of talk about, oh, we're cutting down too many trees, we're using too many trees. Uh, that's not true. I mean, we don't have totally up-to-date statistics because it's actually very, very hard to measure because it's international. But basically, the last snapshot that we had, there is a, a net growth of, of half a million hectares per year of the European forest, um, even with everything that we're doing with it. What we need to do is use less wood for fuel and for paper, where the carbon gets released quickly, but use it more intelligently in ways like chairs, you know, which capture carbon uh, and, and keep it sealed in. That's the, that's the, the gift that we get from wood. So that, that cal the calculation about the growth is super easy because we know, you know exactly how much wood mass is produced per year by the European forest. And that was, uh, I can't remember, so it's like four and a half tons of wood or something. So you can you know, you just run the calculations and you know how long that takes. But you can, I mean, it's a, great, it's a great way of thinking about it. I mean, you know, okay, you cut down some trees. Um, but we have to be, you know, we have to be aware of exactly what the impact is. Nobody, to my knowledge, no architect has gone to a beach to apologize for taking away the sand to make concrete. Or, you know, or followed the trucks and, you know, kind of uh, looked at the, <coughs> you know, kind of smelt the exhaust fumes uh, and, and, you know, developed any kind of awareness of what the actual, you know, the very complex trail of, uh, of making a concrete building is. And there's a lot of concrete in this building, by the way, as uh, there is in, in any building, you know, if you have foundations or what have you. So, the, you know, it's, um, it's true.
<laughs> Don't worry. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious about uh, how you choose uh, the wood for your buildings. Like you mentioned that something you did came from Bali, yep. uh, like some bamboo. Or I'm just curious if you like use uh, wood that come from uh, closed environments to where the work is being developed or something like that. Yep. Um, obviously, one tries to. Um, no, it's a complex. It's a complex question. It's actually there are a few. I should say that more than architects, it's actually builders and developers and, in, and investors, and very often the big investors behind them who've got obligations to decarbonize their their portfolios, who are the most aware of uh, the complexities of this question. Who might you know who actually take apart the whole supply chain? So like in this building, you know where does that bit of wood come from? That one, and it's usually extremely difficult to find out and extremely difficult to control. Um, I tried in my house in Burgundy, we have this beautiful solid oak paneling, which comes from a local company who are very famous and they, you know, they export all over the place and what have you, because their work is extremely good. And I was like, wow, congratulations, local wood. <coughs> so I went down there one day and I said, you know, so what's, what's up? You know, I needed to get one more piece of wood for, for making a bed actually. And uh, I said, so, you know, where does this wood come from? And they said, ah, yeah, hold on. Last week we had a, uh, a shipment from uh, British Columbia, and then there was a bunch from Croatia, uh, and then those 12 trucks out front, you know, they're, they're going off to... So it's actually, <laughs> it's really very, it's, it's a global market. Now, basically, we, we for the project, that it's, uh, I, thank you for the question because I, I can give a locally based answer to it. For the project that we're uh, uh, working on now, just near Biarritz, we have uh, some very interesting wood consultants uh, as part of our team, and I asked them to map a very local supply chain and look at the potential for that. Now, it's very—it's maybe even a political in question of political interest uh, in terms of the complexities of the Basque region being, you know, uh, an international sp space. Um, it turns out that there are kinds of wood that are usable and exploited, which are harvested and transformed on the Spanish side, which you can't get in France at all, which are very interesting. There are hardwoods like chestnut, uh, and then there's some oak, which is used for structural elements. Uh, so we found that, you know, uh, we would be working, into well, you, you would work internationally anyway, but uh, it made much more sense to, you know, stick in the compass and, and draw a circle which goes as far as Santiago, because there's some very, very advanced companies in the Pyrenees and in the Basque countries as well, who are using materials which are not part of the standard palette that we would have uh, in France, for instance. And to be honest, as I you remember the oval, say so 75% of CLT production here, almost everybody gets all their wood from there on a European scale and even a global scale. And actually, some of those companies that were very often small family businesses that started up there, in the space of two generations, they've got huge production facilities in North America now, you know, where they're trying to sort of localize that. And, you know, there's also other crazy things going on with the financing of the wood industry. So it's a very good question. <laughs> what we realized is that we would still need, because of other things like certifications for certain things, for, you know, fire, <coughs> seismic activity, you know, you need, I mean, when you say wood, it's a stupid, word to use because there are commonly 150 different species of trees used in construction now and there are much more in the past and they all have different mechanical hygrometric properties you know you can't build beach is fantastic because it's structurally very very strong if you glue it in sheets uh, but you can't get, let it get wet during the construction you can't really you know let it get humidity guess what it rains a lot around here and we're actually even in the early stages we're looking at can we detail this building in such a way that we can use beach, which is, if, is extremely efficient, and you, know, you can use much, much thinner pieces of wood. You get a different architectural uh, vocabulary from it than you would from, you know, from spruce or pine. Um, can we do that in such a way that the climate here, which is what it is, won't, you know, it won't be a, a compromise? So there's actually the, the architectural language of the building 
is developing, and this may also be the same case for you know chestnut if we source that from from northern Spain, is is actually developing this kind of dance between local conditions, local economy, uh, and supply. And then there's also we need the know-how. Who's going to you know? It's not just taking the wood, you're transforming it, then you're assembling it, and then you're putting it up on site. You know, these are all different parts of the supply chain. As a general rule, though, having said that, you know, and we, we, so we're taking this very seriously with, uh, for, for this particular project, you shouldn't, I think there's, there's a, a slightly dangerous tendency for perfectionism in the wood world to, you know, to ask, uh, to, to it's a guilt complex. You know, we ask ourselves way more questions than the steel and the concrete go to because, you know, they, they've been educated not to give a fuck. And it makes life so much simpler. Uh, so we, you know, you have to. I think, and, uh, I, and I'm able to put these questions, you know, on the table of the CEO of a big company and say, you know, stop worrying about that. You know, you need to progress in a broad way. You know, you need to make several buildings. You need to, you know, raise confidence, and then maybe you can, you know, invest in a sawmill in Sweden or something and start using your local forest. But, you know, it's, it's, that can be a slow process. And also, to be honest, okay, so the, the bamboo from Bali <sighs> doesn't grow to 40 meters high <coughs> in the north of France. So we had to look for an alternative source. Um, we ran the numbers. It was actually, I'm actually quite happy, you know, to, to work economically with the, the people producing bamboo over there through the intermediary of a French bamboo garden. Um, but uh, it was actually, I, I mean, international shipping is, is obviously a very difficult subject in uh, the climate debate, but one container, which was, other people had some space in it as well, it wasn't just for us, it was only about 300 kilos of CO2 equivalent to get it from Bali to here because it was on an enormous ship, you know, with tens of thousands of other containers. So, you know, you have to... And this is also an argument, you know, this is all, all the kind of uh, the evil genius of the, you know, the, the people who've been trying to stymie the decarbonization of society, you know, who were originally the, the same. We know that they're, you know, at the beginning, they were the same advertising executives in the U.S. who persuaded us for a very long time that smoking was good for you. They were using, they just took that, they won that debate. They managed to delay, uh, you know, the... <laughs> the, the knowledge of the health benefits of smoking uh, and, the, and the truth there. And they applied those same methods to, to this debate. So things like, you know, putting us all on a guilt trip for our individual footprint. Okay, it's important, you know, we you know, understand, you know, it's a sort of, uh, you know, we all have our role to play and what have you, but it's bollocks. You know, if the, the real villains are the people who are, you know, kind of, and it's our governments in many ways, you know, who are kind of subsidizing the oil business so that, you know, a building like that, I mean, I'm already facing it with this project here, you know, it's more expensive than a concrete building. Why should it be? There's no true evaluation of the carbon cost in the concrete building, which, you know, is passed on to society in, in so many other ways. So until we actually have a leveling of the playing field, you know, with, with, you know, with a carbon budget, which is starting in countries like Denmark, you know, they're actually, it's one reason I'm very happy to work there. They're slightly, and we're able to influence that even, you know, they're slightly ahead of the, Ahead of the curve of other other countries, until that actually comes into comes into place, you know, there, there will be problems about that. But we we shouldn't feel too bad. That's my. We should be very kind of focused and pragmatic, and, and not you know put too many obstacles on ourselves. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, long time. <laughs> This is, uh, <coughs> so I have, I have five copies of this. They're available signed, but I, I can only take uh, uh, cash for 25 euros. Okay, special, <laughs> special price for having put up with me for an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. That hung around me through the week. Seems 
Dreams to vanish like Go gambler's lucky streak When we 